As I mentioned briefly, living close to a power plant does not reduce the cost of electricity. It is the source of the electricity that dictates the cost to the user. Transmission costs are marginal compared to the LCOE of producing the electricity, and indeed from the EIS itself, it is stated as circled here in red, that the electricity produced at the proposed plant in Luna will go directly to a distribution substation located 160 kilometers away. Our discussion earlier about the amount of electricity that this plant can produce shows that it will likely be consumed elsewhere as there is no demand large enough in Luna. If you remember, we calculated that we can uh, generate enough electricity for roughly 5 million Filipinos with this plant. In summary, while energy economics is a vast topic, we have seen that coal is indeed an important source of energy and will be for the foreseeable future, as renewable energy power plants have high investment costs. However, as we have seen through the LCOE, there is more to the story about the cost of electricity due to highly variable fuel costs and ever-falling technology prices, which are especially the case in solar PV, where the cost is continually falling and becoming more competitive with other older conventional technologies. The Philippines pays among the highest rates in the region and the world for electricity, and we now know that electricity price is mostly determined by the source of the electricity, not the vicinity of the generation to you, the user. What we did not have time to mention was about the hired work for operation and construction of the plant. This is highly skilled labor that is not necessarily promised to locals. Thus, as opposed to creating jobs for Lunarians, uh, it is likely that many workers will have to be brought in. Now to move to the last part of this presentation, the discussion about future alternatives in energy that can be considered as opposed to this proposal. Here's a table taken from the EIS about the possible alternatives and considerations uh, for the fuel sources that could be uh, mentioned or considered for the plant. Uh, while coal has been chosen for the plant, we will look at the claims made for only th the only three renewable energy technologies mentioned, geothermal, solar, and wind. Here's a table, uh, a slide taken from the Philippine Department of Energy about potentials for power taken from various renewable sources uh, available in the Philippines. Uh, also, according to the Philippine Department of Energy Power Development Plan from 2016 to 2040, we should bear in mind that the peak demand was about 13,390 megawatts in May 2016 and is expect expected to reach 49,287 megawatts by 2040. What we can see with this information and from this table is that if we utilize just a fraction of some of these potentials, we could already satisfy that predicted need. I'm not saying that it is easy to do. It will take time, it will take investment, and it will take effort. However, these renewable energy potentials are quite high and represent a real opportunity to become completely self-reliant in our energy and not have to rely on imported and highly cost variable fuels. The argument in regards to solar according to the EIS is that according to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory or NREL, La Union is not among the best sites for solar compared to other sites where utility-scale solar plants are installed in the Philippines. Uh, I went to the NREL resource called the RE or Renewable Energy Data Explorer, which I suggest you all to visit online. 
and where you can see the solar and wind potentials measured by various measures in an area. Um, the area shown here is the exact location of the Calatagas solar plant in the Batangas. Currently, it is the largest PV photovoltaic plant in the Philippines. The direct nominal irradiance, or DNI, which can be seen here, is measured about 4.2 kilowatt hours per meter squared per day. This means that this much solar energy is hitting every meter squared of surface per day. This is actually quite a lot as some areas of the world with PV installations do not reach DNI's direct nominal irradiances of 2 kilowatt hours per meter squared per day. With current solar efficiencies of about 20% conservatively uh, on the average low end, it means that we can generate about 840 watt hours per meter squared per day. Now to put this number into perspective, uh, an average American household uses 25 kilowatt hours per day. And this is the highest household consumption in the world, to put that number into perspective. Americans consume the most per capita and per household. With an installation of about 29 meters squared that could be on the rooftop of a house or on uh, land in front in, in a field, uh, one of these American households could satisfy all their electricity needs with the sunshine that they would receive in the Philippines. And with this, they would never have to pay electricity bills to a utility company ever again. Now this map shows Tarlac City, which is specifically named in the EIS report due to its vicinity to Langyon. What you may notice is that the colors are relatively the same and indeed the DNI here is measured at about 4.5 kilowatt hours per meter squared per day, uh, similar to the 4.2 seen in the Batangas. It's very similar to the Calatagas one. Finally, we have Luna La Union. The point selected is the same site as the proposed coal power plant. Now, I was expecting to see numbers that were much lower or a map that looked vastly different with the colors than previous to. However, the DNI is actually marginally higher at 4.8 kilowatt hours per meter squared per day. And the colors look nearly identical. And when we look at these maps side by side by side, they all look very similar. The DNIs that we attain are nearly identical. And we can see that in this table, uh, very minor differences. And thus, I don't think that it is completely accurate to say, and I quote, that La Union is not among the best sites to install utility scale solar. We can now see that at sites where there are utility scale solar plants, Luna sits right among them in solar potential. Next, we move to wind. Using the same NREL source, we can view the measured wind speeds and wind energy generation potential for regions in the Philippines. On this map, we again see the area of Luna La Union with colors associated to the wind speeds. The EIS document shown at the top here uh, claims that the wind speed of the site is marginal, ranging from 4 to 5 meters per second. And according to the colors on the map and the associated legend, this is true. The wind speeds in the area are within the mentioned range. And it is true that stronger winds will generate more energy. However, it is not true that only strong winds are useful. Smaller wind farms can utilize weaker winds. What is very important, a very important factor in the power electronics of a wind turbine is how constant the wind is. And in fact, there are several studies of small wind generating plants that are able to harness power for small rural communities 
with wind speeds in the 4 to 5 meters per second range, as these winds blow consistently. Similar to the nature of the winds blowing off the South China Sea onto the coasts of Luna. However, once we move further outward to a view of the overall region surrounding La Union, we see a much different story. The dark blue, yellow, and orange, and even red areas signify where wind speeds are much higher, and there is a possibility to generate much more electricity from the wind at these higher wind energy potentials. Areas which are not too far away from Luna itself, as we can see from this map of a broader region of northern Luzon. Recall that the location of the generation has little, if anything, to do with the affordability of the electricity to you, the users. And so, although Luna may not be the best location for a large wind farm in itself, uh, although it's not a bad location for a small wind farm, uh, there are many options in the vicinity where wind energy can be easily exploited. Therefore, the argument goes much deeper than simply looking within Luna itself. The last source of alternative or renewable energy that is mentioned in the EIS and that I would like to address is geothermal energy. The claims made by the EIS are true. The geothermal energy is site-specific and requires studies and infrastructure work to deploy. Briefly, uh, this is the energy that is harnessed from the heat of the inner layers of the Earth. It is commonly used among island nations with tectonic and volcanic activity, such as the Philippines, that have access to superficial high temperatures. Uh, and indeed, the Philippines is a world leader in installed capacity of geothermal energy, with only the U.S. having installed more total capacity among other countries in the world. This is due to the Philippines' geology, which makes it a very good candidate with a large geothermal potential, and, as I have mentioned before, utilizing the geothermal energy potential, or any renewable energy for that matter, uh, this frees the country from price fluctuations of using conventional fuels. Since 1977, when the first geothermal plant was installed in the Philippines, it has been an important part of the energy mix. This graph, this table, shows the development of the installed capacity and generation. Uh, geothermal is what is called dispatchable energy uh, because it is constantly available, 24 hours a day, and thus we can generate with this energy on demand, making it extremely valuable. As you can see from this graph, in 1985, which is this first highlighted row, geothermal energy provided more than one-fourth, more than 25% of the total energy needs of the country. Today, with growing demand for electricity, it provides only about 14%. In 2011, using geothermal energy, we can see here, saved the country about 1.9 billion US dollars in fuel imports, money which could then be used within the Philippines. And in total, from 1977, to 2012, which is the most current data that was available uh, at the time that of the, the World Geothermal Conference in 2015, uh, but from 1977 to 2012, uh, using this energy saved the Philippines over 17 billion US dollars, representing a very important asset which could be tapped by the Philippines as a country.